In this tutorial, we're going to talk about another mathematical concept that we're going to be using quite a lot, and that's the concept of a vector. Now, you may be asking yourself what a vector is, and it's simply a mathematical structure that has more than one part. A lot of people who have a programming background tend to relate vectors to an array. So as an example, we might have a 2D vector, and that would have two parts, such as an x and a y. We might have a 3D vector, and that might have parts x, y, and z. And we could extend this on and have a four-dimensional vector, which might have parts x, y, z, and w. Now realize that they don't have to be named x, y, z, and w. They could be named anything. It's just what I've used here. All right, we can interpret vectors a couple of different ways. And one way we might do this is to interpret a vector as a point in space. However, most commonly, vectors are used to represent both direction and magnitude. Now, to denote a vector, you often write an arrow above it. So for example, you can see that we've got this vector u here with an arrow above it. And there's really two different ways, at least in this class, that we're going to represent a vector. We could have a row representation where we have one row and multiple columns, or we could have a column vector that has one column and multiple rows. And you can see here that we have both a row representation and a column representation that contain the same data. Realize that vectors are going to be used in almost all of the lighting equations that we're going to do in this class. So let's see an example of where we might use vectors. You can imagine that we might create a 2D game that has a player and it has any number of enemies. So the question is, how would you describe the relationship between the player and the enemy? Well, one thing that we do know is that both the player and the enemy have x, y positions, and therefore we could describe the difference in their positions in two parts. We have the difference in x and we have the difference in y. Now notice the notation that we're using here. We're describing the difference in x as delta x and the difference in y as delta y. It's also a good idea to remember that most math libraries have a function called atan2. And if you pass it delta x and delta y, it's going to return you the angle between those two points. So how would we interpret this difference? Well, first you should note that this difference has a magnitude. And by magnitude, we mean length. At the same time, we can also interpret the difference between these two points as a direction. So if you'd like to think in more concrete terms, you can imagine that we could have a line between point 0, 0 and delta x, delta y. And the line between these two points is going to represent the direction of the vector. So there's some basic mathematical operations that we can do with vectors. And so we'll start by looking at adding and subtracting. Now when you add or subtract vectors, we're going to have to do this component-wise, which implies that the vectors have to be of the same size. So as an example, imagine that we're trying to add the two vectors that you see here in front of you, 1, 3, 5, and 10, 4, negative 3. Because I have to do this component-wise, I'm going to add the 1 plus 10, I'm going to add the 3 plus 4, and then the 5 plus a negative 3. And that's going to result in a vector with the values 11, 7, and 2. So you can see that if I add a vector that has three parts, the thing that I add it to has to have three parts, and the result is going to have three parts. Now I can also add these vectors graphically. So for example, I might have vector 1 here and vector 2 here. And if I take the tail of vector 2 and I add it to the head of vector 1, the result would be the vector between the tail of vector 1 and the head of vector 2. And you should also note that subtraction works the same way. Well, what about multiplication? Well, we can multiply a vector by a scalar, which is just a single number. So for example, I could multiply the scalar 6 by the vector 135, and that's going to give me the vector 6, 18, 30. So essentially what we did is multiplied 6 times 1, 6 times 3, and 6 times 5. Now you may be asking yourself if it's possible to multiply a vector times another vector. Well, that operation isn't really defined, but we do have two other operations that we can perform. We have the dot product, and we have the cross product. Before we dive into those concepts, though, we need to talk about the magnitude and normalization of vectors. Now, what is normalization? It's just a fancy way to say that the vector should be of length 1. When we talk about the magnitude of a vector, we're really just talking about its length. And notice that this is denoted with the double bars on each side of the variable. So for example, if I wanted to find the magnitude of the vector 1, 3, 5, you could see that I could take the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And a lot of you are going to recognize this is how we calculate distance. So plugging those numbers in, you can see that it's the square root of 1 squared plus 3 squared plus 5 squared, which is going to be the square root of 35, which is approximately 5.9. Now to normalize the vector, you're going to divide each component of the vector by its magnitude. So if we were to continue the example from above, you could see that I could take the vector 135 and divide it by its magnitude. And that's going to give me the result that you see here. 
Then, if I were to take the magnitude of that result, I should get back the value 1. So in summary, normalization is just a way for us to get a vector of length 1, but to be able to do that, I need to divide each component by its magnitude. All right, let's go ahead and look at the dot product. This is also called the inner product or the scalar product. And to be able to do this, we're going to multiply component-wise and then sum those results together. If we were to write this mathematically, you can see an example here, and we actually have a dot operator. So let's see an example. If I were to take the dot product between the vector 1, 2, 4 and 8, 1, negative 2, I would multiply the values component-wise and then sum that result together. So in this case, we have 1 times 8 plus 2 times 1 plus 4 times negative 2, and that gives us the value 2. So why is this such an important operation? Well, if these vectors are normalized, it's the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. So to be able to undo this result and determine the angle between these two vectors, we're going to use the arc cosine function, passing it the result of the dot product between those two vectors. So how is this relevant to what we're doing in this class? Well, this concept is going to serve as the basis of almost all of the lighting calculations that we do. So let's see some examples of how this might work. Assume that we have two vectors, u and v, and u is the vector 1, 0, 0, and v is the vector 0, 1, 0. First of all, you should recognize that these vectors are already normalized. They have a length of 1. Now, if you look over on the right-hand side, I've tried to visualize this for you. And in this case, we should expect the angle to be 90 degrees. So let's go ahead and do the math. Again, if we multiply these vectors component-wise and then sum those values together, we get the first part of the equation. So in this case, we have 1 times 0 plus 0 times 1 plus 0 times 0. And if we work this out, you can see the result is 0. Now realize that that 0 doesn't represent the angle between the vectors. It represents the cosine of the angle between those vectors. So I'm going to take the arc cosine of 0, which is going to give us our result of 90 degrees. As a second example, imagine that we have two vectors, u and v, again u is going to be the vector 1, 0, 0, and v is going to be the vector negative 1, 0, 0. So in this case, we should expect the angle to be 180 degrees. So again, let's do the math. If we multiply component-wise, you can see that we have 1 times negative 1 plus 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0 is going to result in the value negative 1. And again, this negative 1 doesn't represent the angle. It's the cosine of the angle. So when we take the arc cosine of negative 1, it's going to give us the value of 180 degrees. As a third example, imagine that we have two vectors that are actually parallel. In this case, u is going to be the vector 1, 0, 0, v is going to be the vector 1, 0, 0, and therefore we expect that the angle is going to be 0 degrees. So if we do the math again, you can see that we're going to have 1 times 1 plus 0 times 0 plus 0 times 0 is going to sum up to be 1. And when we take the arc cosine of 1, it's going to give us back 0 degrees. Now realize that another use of the dot product is it allows us to calculate the projection of one vector onto another. So for example, I might have a vector v and a vector w, and I'm looking to see how v could be flattened onto w. Now if you like to think in more concrete terms, you can imagine that the projection of v is actually going to be its shadow onto w. So the first thing that we need to do is to calculate the length of the projection, and this is going to be the magnitude of v times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. In other words, it's going to be v dot w over the magnitude of w. So then what we can do is use that value to scale w down, so the projection of v onto w is going to be v dot w over the magnitude of w squared times w. All right, now another common operation between two vectors is taking their cross product. And when you do this, it's going to give you back a third vector that's perpendicular to the other two. Now, mathematicians have a special operator for this that you can see here, but don't confuse this with the multiplication sign because it doesn't mean the same thing. So let's see an example of how you might calculate a cross product. Well, imagine that we have two vectors a and b, and we're trying to calculate the cross product c. In doing this, we should expect to get back three parts that make up that vector c. And to calculate the first part of c, you would multiply ay times bz minus azby. And if you look here in the middle of the screen, you can see a different representation of that. Now to calculate the third part of z, we would multiply ax times by minus ay times bx. And finally, to calculate the middle part, or the y component of c, we would multiply az times bx minus ax times bz. And again, you can see a different representation of that here in the middle of the screen. And this also might be the reason that they call it the cross product, who knows.
Now there's some interesting things about the cross product. First of all, if A cross B gives you C, then B cross A is going to give you negative C. Another interesting fact that's not used as often is that the magnitude of this new vector C is the sine of the angle between A and B. And again, that's assuming that A and B are normalized. Now here's a couple of questions that would test to see if you really understand what's going on. The first question is, how would we find the normal of a triangle? And again, the normal is the direction that's perpendicular to the plane. Well, let's try to visualize what's going on. First, you know that we have a triangle that has three vertices. In this case, we'll call them point 0.0, point 0.1, and point 0.2. So the first thing that we could do is to create two different vectors between some of the points in the triangle. So in this case, I'll create a vector called u between point 0 and 1, and I'll create another vector I'll call v between point 0 and 2. And again, it doesn't really matter which vertices we pick, so long as we come out with two unique vectors. So to make it easier to see, I'll move these vectors to the side, and as some of you might have guessed, we're going to take the cross product between these two vectors, and that's going to give us the normal of the triangle. Now a lot of folks in computer graphics refer to this normal as the vector n, and we're going to do the same thing here. All right, so the next question is, how can we determine if a triangle is facing away from the camera? So you can imagine that there's a camera out there in 3D space, and it has a viewing direction that's really just a vector. So for visualization purposes, what I can do is take that camera vector and move it over there towards the normal, and then reverse its direction. And when I do that, it's really just a matter of determining the angle between those two vectors. So if I take the arc cosine of the dot product between the normal and the camera, and that value is less than 90 degrees, then I know that that triangle is visible. And again, this is assuming that the normal and the camera vectors are normalized. Now there is one final note. Realize that I can multiply a matrix and a vector so that I can rotate a vector and translate a vector and scale a vector. So in other words, if I take a matrix and I multiply it by an old vector, it's going to give me back a new vector that's been rotated or translated or scaled and so on. So that brings us to the end of this tutorial. Hopefully you have a little bit more understanding about what vectors are and some of the mathematical operations that you can perform on them.